morning. It is 8 o'clock. It is Friday. It is the last day. We are on the home straight. And if you watched the Olympics this year, which were fantastic, and saw Mo Farrow run down the home straight on the 10,000 meters, you know that we keep the best for the home straight. And that is why we're here today. So my name is Mike Ellis. My co-convener for this first part of this session is Mark Williams, who is sitting beside me. And as, you, as you've seen from the rotating slides here, uh, we are merged with another session that is, um, is, is cognate to ours, so confronting the prospects of a four-degree world. And the conveners of, of that are Peter Fromhoff and Jay Gulledge. So without any further ado, to you, I'm going to introduce the first speaker, if I can remember who it is. It's, um, Jay Zalasevich, who will talk on the temporal and spatial scales of an Anthropocene series. Okay, thanks, uh, Mike, for that introduction, and um, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, if I, in, in this talk, uh, we'll very quickly uh, get the, the formalities out of the way first uh, before we get on to uh, the, 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 uh, the, the proper, uh, if you like, the, the science of the Anthropocene. Uh, and here we're dealing uh, with the business of, of, of one part of the study, which is whether or not to formalize the Anthropocene, have it as part of the geological time scale. Uh, so this talk goes through some of the aspects. So if I can have the first, ah, what do I press? What's the next slide? This one? Okay. Uh, first, uh, thanks to the Paleontological Association who have helped uh, sponsor uh, this meeting here. Uh, so it's uh, old fossils and, and new, as it were. Uh, and of course, the Anthropocene, or at least the latest iteration of it, started with uh, Paul uh, Crutzen, uh, who, uh, uh, if you like, drove uh, the idea from about the beginning of, of this millennium. Uh, and uh, next one, please. Right. Uh, and I think most people heard of it in 2002 when this little one page, uh, very vivid, very short, but very effective uh, paper came out in, in Nature. And that's when the idea, I think, really began to, to, to spread. Uh, and, and next, please. Uh, and basically, uh, the, the idea is, is that um, in the last couple of centuries, sometime in that time, um, the world has begun to change. And it's begun to change... Uh, very significantly, uh, but not exactly simultaneously. So human population has gone up, as you can see, markedly uh, in that last um, uh, uh, couple of hundred years. Um, denudation rate has, has increased, but you know, slightly more uh, irregularly. CO2, of course, has, has shot up uh, since about 1800. Temperature has begun to go up. Sea level, well, it's barely budged yet, but we, you know, uh, future centuries will see what, what, what will happen. And the next one, please. Um, and most of the discussion about the Anthropocene has been about uh, history and process and, and events. But geologists think of stratigraphy as rock. So now we'll, we'll look at what kind of rock record is currently being represented by the Anthropocene because that will be one of the key factors uh, in determining whether the Anthropocene becomes real, a part of the time scale uh, or, or not. So, uh, if, and, and the next one, please. Uh, geologists, uh, as many of you know, have two kinds of time. There's a normal everyday time in, in, in years, but usually lots of years, uh, which, which we, we call formally geochronology. Uh, and that is the idea of, if you like, the Anthropocene epoch as part of the Quaternary period within the Cenozoic era uh, and so on and so on. Uh, but it is also, uh, of course, uh, together with every other geological time unit, um, it is part of chronostratigraphy. It is a material unit formed or laid down within a period of, t uh, a, a, an interval of time. Uh, so to go with the Anthropocene epoch, we also have to consider the Anthropocene series. And this is part of the dual, so-called dual hierarchy of geological time. Um, it, it's something which is not entirely uncontroversial, and I personally um, have my doubts about the dual hierarchy, but it is the, the standard means of expressing time in geology. 
and this is how most geologists work. Uh, next one, please. So, um, I think if we take the Anthropocene long term, the far future perspective, almost certainly, and, and the next, um, it, it is going to be quite striking in all sorts of ways. Um, you know, from the vantage point of a few tens of millions in the future, um, it, it is hard to see how there will not be some kind of mass extinction event, uh, some kind of marine transgression, uh, 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 a carbonate dissolution event, and so on and so on. But of course, today we work with the Anthropocene as it is now at its very beginnings. So what do we do with this epoch that is uh, just beginning to unfold rather than has happened? And the next, please. So, and here we, we, we begin to have uh, one problem in, in not so much in the epoch, but in the series, because uh, uh, chronostratigraphy depends upon superposition. Lower is older, upper is younger. Uh, and on very short time scales, next slide, please, that is very commonly mixed up. Simple things like bioturbation, like um, oh, storage of microfossils in, on floodplains before washing them into the sea, uh, by um, uh, 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 sediment deformation of different sorts in sedimentary slumping and so on. Uh, at short time scales, they can significantly disrupt the temporal signal within strata. On long time scales, millions of years, it's negligible. Short time scales, it becomes to be a problem. Uh, and the next. And the Anthropocene is, of course, incredibly short, geologically. Um, in, it, in, in Paul Crutzen's early uh, uh, version, it is from about 1800, that is 200 or something years. Uh, it may even be from, let's say, the mid-20th century. Uh, there's a good signal which suggests you have a big change there. So it is much shorter than the Holocene, which in turn is much, much, much shorter uh, than any other epoch in, in geology. And the next. So that means that scale dependence disruption of time signals in rock uh, are acute. And the next, please. Um, so let's say we have... Um, Anthropocene rock, the urban stratum, what's called artificial ground uh, or um, uh, made ground uh, on geological maps. Uh, you can map it as a unit. It can be meters, tens of meters thick, but, and the next slide, please, um, it's very complicated in terms of, of time. There are the walls of Rome. Uh, they are about, what, 2,000 years old, uh, but they're mixed in with much later repairs. They are right next to modern buildings, and the road in front is being dug into and replaced right now as we uh, speak and listen. Uh, so uh, in that urban stratum, you have a couple of thousands of years of events and time wonderfully intricately mixed up, and the next. Uh, though... If you take newer cities, let's say Shanghai, uh, like that, um, that is all pretty well post-1950. So some parts of the urban stratum are complicated in terms of time. Others are much simpler and you can say are effectively Anthropocene by whatever measure in the next. And we can go through from uh, terrestrial to deep water and look at this. In the next slide... Um, Fluvial records, of course, are complicated, but some may be reasonably simple. If we take the Nile River, and the next slide, most of the sediment that used to flow into the Nile Delta, and the next, now gets held up behind the Aswan Dam. 99% of the sediment is piling up in there to form a very large body of sediment. Next slide. Behind that dam, uh, in a few hundred years, that will be a very large Anthropocene lithosome, part of an Anthropocene series. And the next. Uh, of course, lakes are probably the easiest and the clearest. Uh, and next slide. Uh, lakes show lots of signals uh, which show some of these late events. Nitrogen has been changed around the world because of the Harbour Bosch process. And that shows up in lakes, next slide, uh, as a very clear inflection, about 1950, as the nitrogen isotopes lighten. Uh, and that is a signal all around the world, far, if you like, from cities and urban places, uh, which is a signal of a, of a round about 1950 beginning Anthropocene. And the next, 
Uh, and of course, at about the same time, we have the, the artificial radionuclides coming in, uh, and the next. Uh, and ice, again, has a similar signal. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, if you'd go into the sea, uh, then at least in some places, if you take shallow waters, one can again suggest that a large part of the sediment body has been fundamentally altered since about 19, mid 20th century. Next slide. Um, bottom trawling of the sea has now affected something like 90 plus percent of concentric shelves. Uh, and on that left side, we're now in the continental slope, uh, about 900 meters down. And those trawling tracks here have completely smoothed the, the bottom of that submarine canyon. And of course, under that smooth part, there will be a body of reworked sediment, part of an Anthropocene series if you like, and the next. And yet if you go to the very deep ocean, scale dependence uh, effects creep in with a vengeance. The next. Um, uh, over most of the very deep ocean, um, a few thousand years' worth of sediment are thoroughly intermixed, intermingled by bioturbation. Uh, uh, so in there you can recognize, if you like, individual particles, which, which date from the last 50 or 200 years or whatever, uh, but they do not form part of any sensible lower or upper stratum. So, uh, and the next, please. So maybe to conclude, if we think of an Anthropocene series, um, uh, it, it's, it's complicated and not unproblematic, but in some places one can moderately effectively distinguish a body of rock now, currently, which we can call an Anthropocene series. Elsewhere, it is harder because of this disruption by bioturbation, um, human or, or otherwise. Uh, and that, of course, one might regard a, a, a partly a problem of chronostratigraphy as much a problem of the Anthropocene. Uh, so, uh, so on that note, uh, thanks very much for, for your attention. Uh, and uh, next slide, if there's a next slide. Uh, we, we are still with the question, are we living in the Anthropocene? We have uh, a few minutes, uh, no, no, seconds for a question, if there is one. All right. Okay. Thanks, yeah. All right, let me introduce the next speaker, it's Tony Barnowski, who will talk on the paleontological evidence for defining the Anthropocene. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, so there are three points I want to make about paleontology with respect to the Anthropocene. Uh, and could you advance the slide, please? Um, the first one is that if we're going to really define the Anthropocene as a formal geological epoch, uh, paleontology is absolutely essential because all of the other epochs ultimately were defined on paleontological evidence, going right back to Lyell with their original definitions. Uh, which you see up here, were in fact defined on the percentages of extinct mollusk species in each of the strata of interest. So Lyell originally set up the Eocene, Miocene, Older Pliocene, Newer Pliocene, and the recent uh, defined on those percent extinct species as you see. Um, later on, the Paleocene was carved out on the basis of fossil plants, and then the Oligocene uh, slotting in the intermediate mollusk percentages. Next slide, please. And uh, then Lyell changed the name of the newer Pliocene to Pleistocene. That took on a, a more climatic connotation, although originally it was the, the fossils that defined it. And likewise, the recent turned into the Holocene. Um, when Gervais was looking at fossil mammals in certain sediments, he coined that term. So. That's the first point. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'll, I'll also uh, make clear that modern definitions of the epochs, particularly the boundaries, rely very strongly on paleontology. Um, there's the boundary of the Oligocene and Miocene. And if you look at these columns over here, 
uh, those are the first appearances or co-occurrences of certain species of microfossils, which are a formal part of the boundary definition now. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, Jan made the point that there's a, a fairly strict protocol. Second thing I want to drive home here is that if we're going to define the um, Anthropocene as a formal geological epoch, we have to be similar both in concept and in practice in how we apply paleontology. Um, as Jan said, epochs are time, you can't really touch time, but they have to be defined on something you can touch, and that something you can touch are the rocks and particularly the fossils. Next slide. Um, and the typical way to go, which is sort of opposite the way we went with the Anthropocene, is first you recognize what's going on in the rock record and recognize the difference and turn that then into this concept of dividing up geological time. Next, please. Um, so you have fossils distributed through a rock sequence, uh, the yellow dots there. Next, please. Um, the actual physical entity that you can define by connecting all those dots is, in fact, uh, um, a biostratigraphic zone. <laughs> there we go. Um, and next slide, please. And those biostratigraphic zones, then, are um, help you tell time. On the right here, you actually you see three different taxa. This one ranges through. These two have uh, different relative percentages. So those are, there are many kinds of biostratigraphic zones, and those represent a couple of them. But the point being, uh, that's the physical evidence. Next slide, please. Um, and then the last step in the process is you use those to characterize something you would call, in this case, the Pliocene epoch, and find a place that you think is a particularly good representation, put the so-called golden spike or the uh, global boundary stratotype section and point. And finally, next slide, um, you find ways to date that and come up with this quote, instant in time, which actually has an error bar on it, which is going to be important in thinking about the Anthropocene boundary. Um, so that's, that's the procedure that we need to follow. OK, next slide, please. So then the last point that I'll make is that we actually can provide, uh, apply these identical biostratigraphic principles to recognizing a sedimentary record that defines the Anthropocene on biostratigraphic uh, zones, essentially. And there are several ways we can go about that. Now, some zones are going to be useful, others aren't. So next slide. Um, first, the ones that aren't going to be so useful, tax on range zones. And these are all things that are, are sort of uh, um, defined by the International Code of Stratigraphic Nomenclature. So it's sort of the rule book we have to follow. Um, Range zones, taxon range zones are simply the first appearance of a taxon uh, and range through time. That's not really going to be very applicable to the Anthropocene because there are no species that first appear in the period of time that we recognize as the time when human impacts become dominant. I mean, the obvious candidate, of course, is people, 160,000 years. So if you wanted to do a, a zone, a taxon range zone, that's how long it would be. So probably not applicable. Next slide, please. Uh, you can narrow that down but with the concurrent range zone, say the co-occurrence of humans and domestic fauna, but again, that takes you way back into the Holocene, so again, not applicable. But then there are several that are applicable. Next slide. Um, lineage zones are an interesting concept. So lineage zones are uh, subdivisions of a evolutionary lineage. Um, so think about corn. We start with domestication of Indian corn about uh, eight, 9,000 years ago. 1847, a guy named Reed in, in uh, Nebraska, I think it was, came up with a hybrid called dent corn, which is morphologically quite distinguishable by little dents in the kernel and also bigger cobs. Um, and I, I point out that if we're thinking about paleontological evidence, it has to be something that's going to preserve and be identifiable in the fossil record as well, which corn cobs and kernels are. 
Then in 1950, we have uh, a, a, a genetic mutation, actually, that gives us our sweet corn with these great big ears. So, you know, these sorts of things would show up in the fossil record. Uh, you could imagine setting up a lineage zone based on dent corn or now that we have ways of actually looking at genetic structure in uh, fossil materials, um, even looking at, at the genetics. Okay, next slide, please. Um, probably the most useful are assemblage zones. These are defined by the assemblages of certain taxa that you name. And the obvious one to think about for the Anthropocene is uh, assemblages of introduced taxa, such as these guys, both of which were introduced into San Francisco Bay uh, and have become an integral part of the fauna. Uh, you could e very easily define a biostratigraphic zone with an assemblage zone um, that included native and introduced tax. And I should point out, this is a widespread signal everywhere. San Francisco Bay, we're talking about between 200 and 300, maybe more introduced species, most of those since 1950. That's the same with seaports all over the world, signal on land as well with introduced taxa. Um, next, please. Uh, abundance zones. You can apply the same concept, uh, again, thinking about introduced versus native taxa in any one place. Uh, Pre-human human impact, um, mostly native taxa. In this case, these guys. Post-human impact, you have increasing abundances of, um, of uh, introduced taxa. Next slide. And, and a really interesting way to think about this is also you can divide species into different trophic groups top predators, secondary consumers, primary consumers, and producers in this example. And what you find particularly in marine ecosystems and in the near shore fauna is that as you get introduction of species, uh, what tends to happen is you lose a lot of top predators and you increase the number of species in that primary consumer group. So you could, th those are some fairly concrete criteria that you know, that's not happening in the future. That has happened already. <laughs> okay, next slide. Um, and then finally, probably the most common kind of biozone that's defined uh, in, in modern stratigraphic applications to um, the epic boundaries that are already existing are interval zones where you pick up a significant biohorizon that can be the introduction of a, a particularly distinctive fossil uh, worldwide, um, and or it could be the extinction of taxa. Extinction, actually, we're not there yet. We can't use that to, to define the Anthropocene. Maybe we could, uh, in, in, that, in, the 20, um, in the 1900s, yeah, the 20th century, there were about 500 species that we know went extinct worldwide. Centuries prior to that, it was 100 uh, in the 1800s, and then less than 100 going back further. Um, so you could think about that 500 species as an extinction spike, but the problem is most of those wouldn't be preserved in the geological record because they're either endemic species or, or species that don't fossilize. So uh, more likely introduction of some things like, and and and. Particularly important, I think, will be human-derived tr trace fossils like microplastics uh, or evidence of the road system. Next, please. Uh, microplastics, kind of amazing. These, uh, you know, everything in size from those which are visible to the naked eye to these which truly are microscopic and are used in many of the products that you probably put on your face today when you shaved or used your moisturizer and cream or whatever. These are ending up in the sedimentary record. There's the annual plastic production uh, from the 1960s, and you can see that the, the sample of these sorts of things in surface waters is, is really prevalent, and it's also prevalent in the sedimentary record, and it's probably either going to leave a physical or, or uh, at this point it's a physical signal, but uh, a geochemical signal. Okay, next, please. Um, and then finally, here's an amazing boundary layer. You know, we talk about the boundary clay at the KT boundary. This green is our road system. And when you think about putting together a road bed, there's what's involved. Uh, 
several layers of geologically resistant human-derived strata. Uh, that's probably going to be a more significant boundary layer in the long run than the KT impact boundary clay. Next slide, please. Um, okay, finally, I'll wind up thinking about where would we place the boundary. I think, again, thinking about stratigraphic principles uh, as you go through time. Uh, it's not really the first appearance of a taxon that you pick up. You pick up the time, it's abundant. So we'd want to place the boundary where all these signs are abundant, which, next slide please, is uh, for, for really all of these kinds of zones in the 1900s, around 1950, is where it really picks up. Okay, and uh, finally, um, so I'll just end by saying, uh, I think defining the Anthropocene as a formal epoch clearly is already supportable by paleontological principles that you would apply to other epochs. Uh, what's already out there argues for a boundary near 1950, but what needs to be done is to for paleontologists to start thinking about this modern depositional record the same way we think about rocks and actually define those zones. Uh, last slide, please. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid there's no time for questions on this one. Um, let me remind everybody we do have a poster session this afternoon and you can find these speakers there, I'm quite sure. So let me introduce the next speaker. It is Jed Kaplan, who will talk on uh, From Forest to Farmland and Moraine to Meadow, Integrated Modeling of Holocene Land Cover Change. Okay, thanks everyone for coming, and thank you for the op uh, opportunity to, to talk today. Uh, just start out by, I, I changed the title of my talk a little bit. I, I thought I'd try to be a little bit provocative and give you a little bit of food for thought about when did the Anthropocene begin. I'm not going to try to answer that question, but I just want to talk a little bit about human impacts on the global or on large-scale landscapes over the last um, thousand, several, uh, several millennia, let's say. I just start out with a picture. Uh, this, is, this is, for those of you who are archaeology buffs, this is Scarabray in Orkney, which is an island off the north coast of Scotland. It's uh, a Neolithic, that is to say people were farming here about 5,000 years ago. Um, this is a pretty harsh, pretty remote place. It's way out at the northwestern corner of Europe, and so I just want to make the point here that people were already farming in kind of the remote corners of the known earth um, thousands of years ago, more than five millennia ago. Just need to acknowledge my group who helped me a lot with the work that I'm presenting today and uh, my funding uh, agencies, funding different people who give me the money to work on this kind of thing. I'm going to be pretty short on methods and I'm going to show you a lot of results in this talk just because I'm limited to time. If you have any questions about what I present, please contact me afterwards. Okay, so let's go back about 160 to 200,000 years ago to the emergence of anatomically modern humans. Okay, so people back here in the penultimate glaciation, what you see here is just the um, oxygen isotope stack from marine uh, sediments, um, people emerged as anatomically modern at about uh, between 160 and 200,000 years ago during this penultimate glaciation, but they all lived in Africa, okay? Um, and then we had the previous interglacial, so-called Eemian, and now we're just gonna zoom in on the last 60,000 years or so and we're going to look at now the North Grip Delta 18O just to give you an idea of what climate was like, at least in the northern hemisphere and the polar regions. Um, and what you see is we're in the last glacial cycle, and this is when behaviorally modern humans emerge. Okay, so these people have uh, modern types of art and symbolic architecture. They also um, develop they also uh, develop sophisticated methods for hunting and, uh, and they also uh, leave Africa finally around this time. Humans arrive in Europe and also we see the disappearance of the Neanderthals um, 
shortly, at least in geological time, uh, thereafter. Just by way of um, comparison, since we're in the United States, I thought I should point out that humans arrived in the Americas um, just shortly before the Pleistocene-Holocene boundary. Okay, so um, how did Upper Paleolithic people uh, may, maybe influence our landscape? Well, this is kind of a very dramatic illustration <laughs> people um, of people hunting. Actually, this is, this is supposed to represent hunters at Solutre in France. It's now known that they didn't hunt this way by pushing them off the cliff, but they definitely used fire as a way of maintaining a landscape. And so we are wondering how strong that effect actually could have been over very large scales. And so we return to sort of an old problem in paleobiogeography, which is what I would call the last glacial maximum forested Europe conundrum. And what that is, is what you're seeing here is the result result of a simulation model, a vegetation model, giving you an idea of forest cover at the last glacial maximum in Europe 21,000 years ago. And plotted on top of that are these little circles, and you see they're all orange. Those represent steppe or sort of steppe tundra biomes, okay? And so in this landscape, the paleo data tells us that there should be a lot of step, but models, and it doesn't matter which model you use, almost all models show this kind of very forested or relatively forested landscape. Now what happens when we put people in on that landscape? Paleolithic hunters that use fire for hunting, we're going to see, suddenly a lot of that forest disappears. Okay, and this doesn't require a huge amount of burning. These trees are already pretty stressed because of low CO2 and cold conditions, but people coming back onto a landscape, say once every 50 or 60 years, could have substantially altered the nature of that landscape from something more forested to something much more open. Now you might say, how can you believe this? What data are there to support this idea? Well, what we see here is we have actually very little, but there are some microcharcoal records from the Mediterranean. Um, basically, what you're seeing here is a difference map, and this indicates that burning was still a lot less in the late glacial than it was, or in the full glacial than it was in the Holocene. Um, or in pre-industrial time, but we can still make a picture that's consistent with what we can observe in charcoal records. Okay. We're moving rapidly on. We're going to talk about a little about the Holocene. And I, some of you, many of you may have heard about the enigma of Holocene carbon dioxide and methane, otherwise called perhaps the Rudiman hypothesis. We're interested in this mismatch between what we observe in previous interglacials, um, where, call it, where CO2 and methane tend to decline, whereas in the Holocene, they start rising between six and 8,000 years ago. And I'm particularly interested in the link between these greenhouse gas records and population. What do we know about what people did over this time period? Well, we invented pottery, we domesticated animals. This has started, people talked about this already. We started metallurgy, rice cultivation, invented iron plows, um, and ultimately created massive cities already several thousand years ago. So we are, humans had some kind of environmental impact already thousands of years ago, but there's a big controversy about how big that could have been. There's um, very widely differing data sets that suggest large or small human impact, say, at one, one or 2,000 years ago. Um, we're trying to tackle this problem and do a better job by really starting from the bottom up. And what you're seeing here in this animation is a simulation, is a scenario of the spread of agriculture, uh, both through farming and pastoralism, uh, starting in the starting in the mid-Holocene, and it's going to take you through to pre-industrial time. So we're starting out to try to do a better job of understanding past human impact on the landscape, on the global landscape, by figuring out who was doing what, where, and when. And one of the ways we do that is by employing these kind of scenarios, and what you're basically seeing here is the spread of agriculture and what I call obligate pastoralists. These are people who live in places where it's too cold or too dry. You see that in the Americas there are no pastoralists because we had no pasture animals, really. Um, and people arrive over most of the global landscape by the pre-industrial time. There are very few hunters and gatherers left on Earth, as you well know. Um, putting all that together, and there's a lot of steps in between I don't have time to go into, but I want to just show you a new scenario that we have of anthropogenic land cover change over the Holocene. And what you're seeing here is what I call used fraction of the grid cell, which does not is not equivalent to deforestation. 
And this is an important distinction to make. We're not talking about total uh, modification of the Earth's land surface, but what we are talking about is human use of a landscape for agriculture, yes, but also for pasture, for, for gathering, um, for forest browse, for various different kinds of land use. And you see that, you saw that spreading out from essentially the main centers of domestication of agriculture uh, in the mid-Holocene, and it's now um, expanding out across the globe. And what point to make here is that by the Iron Age, say 3,000 years ago or so, big parts of the Mediterranean, of China, parts of India, and even Southeast Asia were already pretty impacted by human activities. That is to say that there was no real wilderness left. There was no place on earth where people, where human activities were not um, somehow impacting the landscape and the other fauna and flora that were living there. And so we're just going to race through to the late... Um, pre-industrial time, 1850, and you get an idea of how much of the world was already sort of one way or another impacted by human activities. Uh, what does this mean in terms of, say, the carbon cycle and greenhouse gases? I don't really have time to go into this. You can look at some of my papers or ask me afterwards. Substantial carbon emissions over the entire Holocene, and we can maybe link then human populations, which is what you see in this upper curve, to the atmospheric carbon dioxide record recorded in ice cores. What else do we know? We had a paper come out earlier this year on the methane record, and what you see here is methane concentrations over the last 2,000 years and the isotopes of methane, and we linked these excursions, these positive excursions in methane isotopes to periods of more intense human activity, so during the Roman period, during the early medieval period, and again uh, later on, um, in later on towards the crisis of the, of the 14th century, and we said these were periods when deforestation and industrial anthropogenic activity, including charcoal production, metallurgy, had a signal that was strong enough to be recorded in polar ice. We also have looked at soil erosion over the Holocene, um, Eastern Mediterranean, parts of Asia, and certainly in the Americas. We've tried to show that anthropogenic deforestation led to substantial amounts of soil erosion over uh, the last um, 200 years, and in fact, may uh, two last, sorry, 8,000 years, and may even have led to the development of severely degraded ecosystems. Um, so just putting all that together, I would like you to think about the idea that humans had a substantial impact on the very large-scale landscapes, on continental-scale landscapes over the last 8,000 years at least, but possibly going back into the time of the emergence of the first behaviorally modern humans, when people really started using fire as a tool for managing landscapes. And I'll just uh, leave you with that, and you can watch the animation of the land cover change scenario one more time. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker now, who is Peter Half, and Peter's going to talk on transport and purpose in the Anthropocene. So, Peter. And, uh, light comes on at 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to talk about some uh, fundamental aspects of the dynamics of the an Anthropocene seen as a physical system. In a particular, I want to look at the uh, problem of how human purpose adds to the more standard classical transport mechanisms of energy and mass that all geological epochs um, uh, have, have experienced. Um, Next slide, please. So we're talking about the dynamics of the anthroposphere, which uh, for purposes here I take to be the, the, the sum of all basically human-created things, the technological, economic, bureaucratic, um, governmental systems, and all the artifacts or parts that make up those larger systems, including humans as discrete uh, components of the anthroposphere. So thank you. And the, the issue is that for transport, there's a special problem in, with the Anthropocene that technology which, on which the Anthropocene is 
largely uh, based is, is a solid phase phenomena. That is, you can't build technology out of fluids alone. And it turns out that solids are very difficult to, for nature to transport, that until the Anthropocene, uh, large-scale fast movements of, uh, of solids were, were limited to very special circumstances until after four and a half billion years, uh, the Earth uh, finally figured out a mechanism by which to move such, uh, such substances, but, and that required the invention or the evolution of intentional uh, human intention and human, human purpose. Next slide, please. So uh, I can analyze this kind of picture in terms of what I call bipolar transport systems. If you look at the anthroposphere cartoon at the top, at the, at the, um, at the, at, there's, a, there's a product, you can think of a production zone of coal, of food, of factory goods that is then transported to a consumption zone, say a city, so kind of a bipolar transport system. Turns out that many transport systems in, in geology can be analyzed as bipolar systems. For example, in the, in the hydrosphere, if you, you just look at the river, you produce water at the top, you transport it down, and then it's consumed by the ocean. And in a system I'll talk about in a minute, in the laboratory, there's a so-called Rayleigh-Bernard cell in which you have a hot plate at the bottom, a cold plate at the top, a fluid in between, and when this temperature difference is large enough, the fluid starts to convect and heat is produced at the bottom, is transported to the top, and consumed again uh, at, the, at the top. So this bipolar system is, is very common. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? I'll use it uh, to talk about anthropospheric dynamics. The, the problem with transporting solids is the following, that in, in a fluid, you typically have, in, in this particular, in the Rayleigh-Bernard cell, for example, a constant force field existing across the cell, um, which gives rise to a continuous buoyancy force that drives the convection of fluids. But in the technology cell that is in this bipolar um, system where you have some, some solid or semi-solid goods or products that need to be transported to some uh, other, uh, other area, there exists no extant um, uh, potential that would produce a force that would, move this, that would move the material from the production zone to the consumption zone. In other words, there's a missing, a missing force gradient in the technology cell, and that's a problem that nature only solved recently. Uh, and so to understand how you can have transport without an intervening force field, uh, you have to, we have to kind of enlarge our uh, picture of, uh, of how transport works. So if I can have the next slide, please. So, and one way to do this is through consideration of purpose. So I want to define purpose as kind of a physical property of systems. If I look at the first bullet here, that the parts of a system that does something support the activity of that system. That's what you mean by a system, basically. And therefore, we can say that the parts of a system act as if they had the purpose of supporting that system. This is the basic kind of fact of organization. And therefore, I make a little jump and I say that the purpose of parts is to support the system function. It amounts to a definition of purpose. And in this sense, uh, purpose is inherent in all systems. So I want to make use of this idea and go to the next slide, uh, please. So for even in a physical system like the Rayleigh-Bernard cell, if we look at the bottom, here's the hot plate. Physically, there's a very thin conduction layer where molecules conduct heat up to the interior. It's, Heat is absorbed here by the fluid, it expands, and then it floats to the top under buoyancy. But in terms of purpose, I view the purpose of these molecules is to go down, the, each one grabs a glob of heat, of energy from the hot plate, it dumps it into this conveyance device here, that's the purpose of those particles. And then the purpose of these molecules is once the conveyance device is full, that is this blob, is to take it up to the top where the reverse unloading process happens. Next slide, please. In the technology cell, or one example of the technology cell, I have a production of a solid good here, say, say coal. And then the purpose of these parts, like that guy right there, is to move this, to load this solid stuff onto a transport conveyance. The purpose of the train is to move the coal up to a consumption zone. And then there's a similar downloading process that happens uh, in the, at the other end. So both of these systems, in fact, all these bipolar systems have a similar structure. Can I have the next slide, please? And well, can we back up one? Uh, in, in, in order to, to for, the, for the production zone and the consumption zone uh, 
to kind of coordinate their activity because they both need to support. They both have to have the same purpose, to support the overall function of the system. There must be some emergent um, a coordinating parameter that will um, guide the, those two production and consumption ends toward the same purpose. So I can have the next slide, please. So for example, in the, in the Rayleigh-Bernard cell, that uh, coordination parameter is the inverse of the little conduction layer at the bottom, the so-called thermal boundary layer. And if I plot the flux of energy in, in the cell as a function of the, of the coordinating parameter, the flux through the hot plate increases as the coordinating parameter increases. You can show that the flux through the cold plate decreases as the coordinating parameter increases. And therefore, the two ends of that cell can have the same purpose to supporting the overall function of the cell only for one value of the coordinating parameter, which ends up right here. And then this is the energy flux through the cell. Now, in the next slide, we look, if we look at um, a technology cell, we have to identify a suitable coordinating parameter. And one such parameter is price. And so here is the amount of goods transported at the rate, and here is the price. And as price goes up, the consumption at the, the, the production rate at the, at the production end of the cell increases, and the consumption rate at the absorption end uh, of, the, of the consumption end of the cell decreases. And then the two ends of, those, of that cell uh, work to the same purpose if they coordinate their action by the price. So they come to agree on the same price here, and then this is the amount of good that's that's transported. Now, of course, this has been discovered empirically by economists as a supply-demand curve, but they, all these systems have the same kind of structure. Have the next slide, please. Um, so this is, this is my last slide, so I have a little, little time for uh, discussion of this rather brief uh, um, description I, I've given. The overall picture is this, that in the Anthropocene, which is a uh, uh, based on solid phase technology, because that's the only way you can, you can do technology, there's a problem of, of, of creating the system in the first place because there aren't any natural forces that are strong enough, basically, uh, to, to move all the parts into place as we construct the technical part, the, the built part of the anthroposphere. And so to see, to try to understand uh, or, or, or create a framework in which to uh, under, understand how, in fact, the parts of the anthroposphere could come together, we kind of enlarge our mode of thinking about uh, transport to include the concept of purpose. And then if you do this, you have the problem of making sure that the purpose of all the parts in the system are actually supporting the operation of the system they're, that they're a part of. And that's simply a requirement of the fact that this, the system is, is organized in the first place. So that means that there must be some emergent macroscopic coordination parameter that appears in the system. If you can identify what that coordination parameter is, then you can use that to write down the dynamics of the system, at least in a kind of a crude initial way. And that's what we did in the last two, uh, last two examples. So um, th this kind of development shows that, that um, it just illustrates the point that, that human purpose is really an essential uh, essential component of, uh, that had to appear before anything remotely like like technological materials could appear on the surface because the, the mechanisms simply didn't, the physical mechanisms simply didn't, didn't exist before. And, and so d does that have any, in, any consequences? Well, I, there is a, um, let me offer a thought, okay, uh, or a suggestion. It's not a claim or not an assertion of any kind. But in terms of, in terms of purpose, it's, it's easier for the parts of a system to, and in particular humans in this case, to support an increase in the metabolism of the system to which they belong than to oppose that, than to, than to decrease the metabolism because the former is more consistent with their purpose in the system. And so if, if that's the case, then what I, what I think this suggests is that over the longer term, um, most, in, most environmentalism today is aimed at the, the latter strategy of trying to dial down the metabolism of the anthroposphere. I think that the fundamental dynamics of anthropospheric dynamics actually leans in the other direction toward a higher energy consumption, higher metabolism, higher energy consumption rate, and higher resource use rate. So my, if I had to make a prediction, um, I, I would say that the table is tilted more toward, toward a more rapid increase of energy and resource use. And in the future, 
whatever our solution, if we come to one of the environmental problem, it will be one that is more energy intensive rather than less energy intensive. Uh, thank you. So I just want to thank all our speakers for keeping time and just to apologize again that we don't actually have time for questions within, within the session at this stage. So we're going to move on to um, our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Davo Vidas. He's going to speak on the Anthropocene and the, an international law of the Holocene. Thanks, Davo. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you, and I guess I am the only lawyer on this panel. Um, and this is my only slide. It's not very imaginative. <laughs> um, but what I wish to do is simply to share a few words with you, a few thoughts, from the perspective of international law. And I would first wish to say that from that, this perspective, I think that the organizers of this conference did well to join what was originally proposed as two sessions, one on the Anthropocene and the other on plus four degrees Celsius world. Um, before entering into that matter, there is one basic question to start with. Is the Anthropocene an issue of international law? And if you would pose this question to a lawyer or to an international law specialist, and trust me, I've asked many so far, uh, the response you would get from most is approximately anthropo what? <laughs> uh, to be frank, most international lawyers react still today to the term Anthropocene. I would say approximately like the automatic spelling check of the Windows Office program. They have never heard for the term. Um, the term Anthropocene is not in the system, and not yet. And for a lawyer, when something is not in a system, it is not relevant. However, the Anthropocene is of potentially great importance. For international law, for the future of international law. Or better to say, for the future of relations that are regulated by international law. Our task at this early time of the 21st century is to explain why the Anthropocene is relevant already today and why it will become highly relevant for international law of tomorrow. And of course, why is all that so very important? And if I'm not wrong, we have approximately nine minutes left for this rather challenging task. Um, so let me start with it. Um, let me say that the matter is twofold. It is first about the term itself, uh, about the scientific formalization of the term Anthropocene. And second, it is about the substance, which exists with or without formalization. In stratigraphy, the matter of possible formalization of the term Anthropocene will have different effects from those it may have for international law. The imminent effect on international law could be that of critically raising the awareness. Now, why would the Anthropocene be so important just for international law as an awareness-raising term? The reason is in that some core aspects of international law rely on the assumption, never questioned due to our experience so far, that the stable conditions of the Holocene will last forever. One can even go so far to say that the definition of current international law is in many respects that of a system of rules resting on foundations 
that evolved under the circumstances of the Holocene assumed to be everlasting. International law simply takes the conditions of the Holocene for granted. And on that premise, on that fundament, a huge building of international law has been built over the past several centuries. I will come back to that important aspect in a moment. Before that, I would only wish to say that there is one additional link of, between the Anthropocene and international law. Um, the development of international law, especially since the early 17th century, has in fact contributed to creating the conditions of the Earth system as we have them today, and as we may have them for some time to come. The reason is in the ideology introduced and best expressed in the famous book by Hugo Grotius, Mare Liberum, The Free Sea, published in Leiden in the spring of 1609. That little book, it had only 66 pages by a rather generous font, that book made a lasting impact on the state of affairs as we know them today. In more recent years, we like to call that globalization. After all, some 90% of global trade are untransported on seas and oceans. And it is exactly that part of international law, the law of the sea, that may first experience the need for profound reconsideration of the accepted rules in view of the Anthropocene perspective. The law of the sea applies to approximately 71% of the surface of our planet. It received its current framework in the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. That convention by now has a near universal participation. There are 164 parties to the convention, of which 163 are states, and one is the European Union. And next Monday, on 10 December, we will be marking 30th anniversary of the Convention, since it was open for signature. The Convention is to a large extent about rights, territorial rights. The Law of the Sea Convention explains how oceans and seas are divided between states in a number of maritime zones. That is a very complex story which has evolved over the past four to five centuries, about how the ownership and the rights to use the marine part of our blue planet have been divided between some 150 coastal states, as we have them today, and approximately 45 landlocked states, or between industrially developed and those less developed, or between those pronouncedly maritime naval powers, and those less maritime and less strong. The basis for all those different maritime zones is one line. A line which in each case is determined with reliance on a coastal geography. That line is called baseline. All within the baseline are internal waters of a coastal state. From the baseline, territorial sea is measured, and it can be uh, up to 12 nautical miles. Contiguous zone could be 24 nautical miles. Your exclusive economic zone could, be, could stretch up to 200 nautical miles. There is continental shelf equally 200 miles, but it can also go as long as 350 nautical miles from the coast, depending on, on the bottom, sea bottom geograph, uh, geology. Um, but at this point, I wish to stress how appropriate it is, in view of international law implications, to join the Anthropocene with the plus four degrees Celsius world. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea has based its complex structure of maritime zones on something that we appropriately might call the law of Holocene. That is an assumption that coasts will, more or less, remain stable as they are today. In the current law of the sea, 
there is no place to accommodate your plus four degrees. Since the basic assumption is that sea levels will remain largely stable. That is the basic premise of the, my own discipline. If that changes to any significant extent, our law of the sea building, as we know it today, might literally fall into water. But there are even more fundamental challenges for international law as it leaves the Holocene and enters the Anthropocene. Perhaps the most fundamental issue for international law is, of course, the definition of what the state is. Today's international law relies on the concept of a defined territory and control over it as a constituent element of statehood. In view of prospects of sea level rise, this core aspect of international law could become questioned, and for the first time not by political changes, but by changes occurring in nature. All this may um, require profound re-examination of some accepted perspectives of international law. With the onset of the Anthropocene, the first matter that international law will have to acknowledge is that we have a problem. I don't know if it is appropriate to say, but well, here in the US, it is Houston, we do have a problem, yes. But immediately after saying that, in fact, after becoming aware of that, we, international lawyers, will have to look for the new ways to solve the problem. In that, the primacy of human rights may have to be recognized, perhaps even above the territorial rights. For that to happen, we may have a long way to go. But the problem is, we do not know how much time we have at disposal. We do not know that. Thank you. You could just bear with us a moment, folks. We're just going to pass over conveners. sobering segue from uh, the first half of this important symposium to the second, and I'd like to move forward with our um, four sets of, set of four speakers, starting with uh, Dr. Robert Watson, uh, Can Human-Induced Climate Disaster Be Avoided? Bob? Can I control the slides? Yes. Oh, fine. Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, what I want to do is actually, to be quite candid, if anyone heard my talk on Wednesday, you can go to sleep now, because I've taken a subset of the same slides, given the uh, topic. Uh, quite clearly, there's no doubt whatsoever, we humans are changing the composition of the atmosphere, and we're changing uh, the climate. Excellent evidence on change in atmospheric composition, both the trace gases and aerosols. We're seeing changes in temperature, precipitation, sea level rise, the extent of mountain glaciers, the extent of sea ice. We're seeing changes in extreme weather events, and we're seeing changes in uh, cyclonic events. So clearly, there, is ch there are changes which can actually only be explained by invoking human activity. Whoops, wrong direction. This shows you the global CO2 emissions and carbon intensity. On the left-hand side in blue are the emissions of carbon dioxide. And as you can see, they were increasing rapidly from 1960 until the oil crisis in 1973. It's flattened, if anything, went down for a couple of years. Then it started to go up again at very parallel. Then we saw the US savings and loans crisis. It actually went down, and then it went parallel. And we saw a couple of others. In other words, every time we've had a major crisis that's affected energy at production and use, we've uh, gone down for a couple of years and gone up almost on a parallel line, except now. 
And what we saw was a decrease in 2009, and that, but suddenly about a 5.9% increase uh, afterwards, pushing us back up almost onto the original line. And a paper came out earlier this week that shows it's gone up another 3% in the last year. In other words, even at a time of significant economic recession in many parts of the world, carbon dioxide emissions have continued to increase. The red line does show that is a slight... Um, uh, their slight improvement on energy intensity or carbon intensity rather. This simply shows the carbon dioxide record at one particular location. The thing to note is we first started to talk in 1992 when we formed the UNFCC of we've got to get to grips uh, with the issue of CO2 emissions and climate change. And as you can see from this slide at that particular time of the first IPCC assessment, the UNFCC, we're around 355 parts per million. We're now basically nearly 400 parts per million. We clearly have not taken this issue seriously. These are some of the projections that came out of the um, fourth assessment report, which simply argues we've observed around 0.7, 0.8 degrees Celsius uh, change in temperature. That's globally average. Land warms more than the oceans. The high latitudes warm more than the tropics. And relative to the year 2000, we would project in a, in a period of no substantial energy policies or climate policies, that the temperature would go up another 1.4 to 6.4, taking the uncertainty into account. That takes into account uncertainty in the climate sensitivity factor and uh, uncertainty in what the emissions will actually be, fundamentally relative to pre-industrial uh, potential change of 2 uh, to 7 degrees Celsius. So what do we need to think about? Uh, Rosina is going to talk about the implications of a change in the Earth's climate but this is a variant of the uh, red ember diagram from the IPCC working group 2 all it simply argues is many of the issues we care about food security water security biodiversity and ecosystem services extreme weather events and the potential of abrupt or major irreversible changes they all become more serious or potentially more serious as the temperature increases you get changes in precipitation changes in sea level especially changes in extreme events and so politically governments around the world in Copenhagen and then endorsed in Cancun, Durban and I believe again in this week in Doha have argued we should try and limit human-induced climate change to about 2 degrees Celsius. Now, there is no safe limit. Some people say, ah, 2 degrees is a safe limit. There is no such thing as a safe limit. We are already seeing some changes, some positive actually in some parts, increased food production in temperate latitudes, decrease, however, food production in the tropics. We're already seeing changes on biodiversity. So 2 degrees is not a safe limit. It was a political decision that we should try and limit to 2 to minimise the negative effects of human-induced climate change. So, okay, what would it take to limit it about two degrees Celsius? There's many, many calculations. This one comes from Stern. What it says is we've got a 50-50 shot if we can limit uh, the, the atmospheric concentration of CO2 equivalent that is bringing into a, account not only CO2 but the other greenhouse gases, uh, that we have a 50-50 shot if we can stabilise around 400. Well, where are we today? Uh, CO2 is around 395 or thereabouts. If I add on methane, nitrous oxide uh, and tropospheric ozone, we're probably around the high 400s, maybe even getting close to 500. The, CO, the effectiveness actually is a bit less than that because we've also uh, put in sulfur precursors. So we have the aerosol effect, both the direct aerosol effect and the indirect aerosol effect that offsets some of the global warming due to greenhouse gases. So it's been thought until up till very recently that the indirect effect of the aerosols roughly offsets um, the non-CO2 gases and the net effect is more like CO2, but that's changing and I'll comment into one second. So what are the chances of stabilising at 400 parts per million CO2? I think zero. Uh, we've got a 50-50 shot of a three degree world at 550. What's the chance of that? A bit better, but I'm not too optimistic. And we've got a 50-50 shot of a four degree world at 650. And I personally believe that's much more the pathway we're on today. This is actually the, comes from the uh, fourth assessment report. And it's what I've said. You can see the radiative forcing um, effectively uh, for CO2, uh, the non-CO2 gases, then this so-called offset of total aerosols. This is the change since pre-industrial. The argument being at, the, at that particular time is the net forcing was somewhere around 1.75 watts per square metre. 
The latest IPCC, in a very draft report, would argue, and that's some of the literature, of course, I can't quote the uh, IPCC report, but the literature potentially suggests that we've been overestimating the direct and indirect effect of aerosols, and they don't completely offset the non-CO2 gases, and so the net radio force may not be the 1.75 or thereabouts watts per square meter of CO2, but maybe more like 2, 2.4, 2.5. Uh, we have to think about the implications of that. Oops, let me go back one. So, how could we potentially reach a two-degree world? Well, it, it depends on the cumulative emissions of CO2 between now and 2050. And so, effectively, what you see here is what if you could actually get global emissions to peak in 2010, 2015, 2020, and 2025. Well, we know they haven't peaked in 2010. We know they're not going to peak in 2015. I'm not at all optimistic they'll peak in 2020. The negotiations in Doha, when I Googled it last night, said we're still arguing about who's got the historical emissions, who's got responsibilities for emission reductions, what do we mean by equity, who's going to fi finance developing countries on the transition. So it sounds that Doha is not going much faster than we went in Durban, Cancun and Copenhagen. Um, if that's true, the most we could potentially hope for is maybe a global peak in 2025. Uh, um, I hope I'm wrong, and I hope we can peak before that. Well, if we do, uh, if we do peak in 2025, what it would mean is to reach a two-degree world, we'd have to peak We'd have to have negative emissions by 2040. I just do not buy that scenario at all. So I am very, very pessimistic about a two-degree world. I believe we're definitely moving to a three, four, five-degree world. And the Blue Planet Laureates, of which I'm one, we wrote a paper saying, if you're really optimistic, you have a 50-50 shot of three, but you certainly it's probably a fair chance of hitting five. This is a, a UNEP slide. Um, the grey area at the bottom is what would you, what's the range, because there's an uncertainty, that you would need to hit a two-degree world by 2020. To be on that right pathway, you'd need to have sort of global emissions around 43, 44 tons, uh, uh, gigatons of CO2 equivalent. Business as usual, a term I don't like, suggests that 2020 would be about 56. And as case one to case four is different interpretations of the commitments governments have made today. Even if you believe case four where they were really met the obligations that they claim, there's still a major gap between what you would need to be around 43 uh, gigatons and the 50 of case four. And to be honest, we're much more on a case one scenario aiming at about 53, 54. So in other words, we are definitely not on the pathway to a two degree world. Um, this, you, I've already really shown this, and as I've already said, uh, in 2010 there was a 5.9 percent increase, and again this year, another t or last year, 2011, about a 2.9 percent increase. Absolutely no indications of taking this issue seriously. Uh, land use, land use change must also be taken into account. That is our agricultural practices, deforestation practices. Yet while cement and um, uh, energy are the most important, we must not forget we need to deal with agriculture and forestry, especially at a time where we're going to need to meet a, a doubling of demand of food between now and 2050. This just simply says that coal is still the biggest use of, sing of fossil fuel, uh, followed by oil and gas, cement much less. Obviously, with fracking and shale gas, there could well be a significant increase in the next uh, sort of decade or so of gas and a decrease in coal. That would help at some level, but it's not a solution. It, it would slow down the rate of change. This shows you where are the emissions coming from. And as you can see, in the last few years, China has grown dramatically in the last 10 years because of their very strong economic growth of average in 10% per year. Um, uh, and you can see it's overtaken the US. But from an equity standpoint um, effectively and these are the per capita emissions while China is now starting to reach the emissions of Europe still well below the USA so the debate is on the historical emissions and per capita emissions these are a series of policy scenarios a rate a change in radiative force in relative to pre-industrial of 8.5 watts 6 watts 4.5 and to make a two degree world you have to be on that green line at the bottom 
You can see what the observations are. Uh, that's the black line called observed. Uh, we're clearly not likely to get on that green line. I'm very skeptical we'll get on the blue line, etc. So we've got a major issue. If indeed we are on one of those upper lines, what does it mean for temperature? Well, you can see for yourself. The only one that comes close to a two degree world really is that very bottom scenario. And there is no evidence politically that we're moving there. So clearly, uh, one has to be quite concerned. We need technology transformation. We need to put a price on carbon. And most important, at least to me, is we need to mobilize behavior change. Uh, the technological options are here. They're the classical ones. Things like carbon capture and storage, absolutely critical. I don't see we can get to a low carbon economy without both carbon capture and storage and nuclear power. Um, yes, we could look at the short-term uh, forces such as methane, uh, ozone, uh, tropospheric ozone and black carbon. That would buy us a little bit of time and we should give very serious consideration to that. Geoengineering, whether it's solar radiation management or whether it is uh, carbon management, I think we need to do more research. To me, this is a very poor second best. We need to go to a low carbon economy, uh, but we should at least do research in geoengineering just to understand what the implications are of solar radiation management or carbon management and the conclusions really are we are not on a pathway to a two we're not on a pathway to a two degree world it's not just an energy issue as you can see it's also how we manage our land governance reform is absolutely needed we need to get rid of perverse subsidies we need to fundamentally have advances in science and technology an apollo scale program on things like carbon capture and storage there are solutions we need political will we need moral leadership and at the moment, we're not going in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Bob, I just want to, um, I know we're short on time, but I do want to provide one opportunity for a question, if there is a, a burning question from the audience. Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, there's no question. All the emerging economies, whether it's China, whether it's India, Brazil, South Africa, the rate of increase per capita of energy use clearly goes up with a disposable income, basically. No question whatsoever. In fact, India is coming out. It's way below even China at the moment, but it's certainly going in one direction. Thank you, Bob. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Rosina Bierbaum, speaking on the impacts of a four-degree world on sustainable development. Rosina? Can I do my own? All right, thank you very much. Good morning. It's always hard to come after Sir Bob. He leaves so little to say, but since I'm laryngitic, that might be a good thing. Um, many of the slides that I'm going to show you are from the synthesis that John Schellenhuber and Bill Hare did for, from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and this was done for the World Bank. But I'm also going to draw on some of my own work and from elsewhere. I certainly don't want to rehash all of the science so eloquently stated, but instead want to focus on the link to sustainable development and the need to develop what I would call usable science and the need to further both adaptation science and adaptation practice very rapidly. So uh, where are we? Looks like I can't tell you. Where are we? You know the litany, the temperatures are increasing, CO2 levels are increasing, sea levels accelerating, impacts are being linked to climate change that affect people and ecosystems. We just heard business as usual could mean four degrees by 2100, could mean a meter of sea level rise with increased extreme events of all sorts, heat waves, droughts, floods, intense storms, fires. And many assert, as Bob said, that there are cost-effective options that could get us on a lower temperature path, but that these global emissions have to begin to drop essentially immediately today. And against this stark reality, though, another one must be juxtaposed. And, and I think it's shown most dramatically by the night lights. And this shows us where those who have live and those who have not live. And the 1.2 billion people on the planet who don't have the lights have contributed less than 10% of the greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. And they are poor, they're malnourished, they're illiterate, they have no access to modern energy and little clean water in today's world. So poverty alleviation and lifting these poorest up to a higher standard of living is absolutely necessary even as we seek to solve the climate change problem.
But the world of tomorrow will exacerbate these inequalities as these two previous reports that I did with John Schell and Huber in 2007 and 2010 outlined. Most of the impacts are going to be negative, especially for the poorest. Essentially all sectors in all regions are going to be affected simultaneously. Our international institutions, regional, national institutions are ill-prepared to manage and that we really need both mitigation and adaptation because it's too late to avoid substantial climate change and the longer we wait to begin adaptation, the more expensive it gets. The messages of these reports have gone largely unanswered and so we really face a crisis. Um, we've lost at least a decade and um, what is possible, as we heard, business as usual is likely to take us up to three degrees. Um, and if all of the global commitments are met, and I think that's a big question, that will certainly take us beyond two degrees and a 50% chance of going beyond three. Not everything that could be done is in those commitments. And you have seen these lines, the AR5 low emission scenario. So this conundrum of where we are and we, where we need to get to is not a new message to us, the science community. But I would argue sometimes it's really important to have a new messenger. And I think that's what happened with the response to the World Bank report commissioned of PIC by the new World Bank president, Jim Kim. So he is actually the first scientist to head the bank and is convinced that climate change makes mis achieving the mission of the bank, which is really to alleviate poverty, much harder and possibly completely impossible if temperatures exceed four degrees. And this paper was commissioned to help the bank think about how it can protect people and property and ecosystems and infrastructure in a changing climate. This report had many, many commentaries, and I just show you a few of them, but I think the, the words that I highlighted are really interesting, raising issues of justice, equity, leadership, emergency. The media treated it far more than the usual science report that hits the streets with millions of hits. And here, in fact, is the, the cover of the report. So what did it say? I think you know the message. It said there's a 20% risk of more than four degrees by 2100. The poor will be affected the most. Some land regions um, will be affected more. And you might actually be approaching physiological limits for livestock and people in particular areas. That will put the tropics in a whole new climate regime. What was termed, what will be termed cool by the end of the century uh, is warmer than the warmest months now. There was a fair amount in the report about extreme events since those are what really cause human pain and suffering. Heat waves such as those in Russia in 2010 are likely to become the new normal summer in a four degree world. There will be uh, unprecedented heat waves expected uh, in um, South America, Central Africa, tropical islands of the Pacific, and ocean acidification. Uh, they also have a section on socioeconomic concerns talk about small island states and cities that are especially vulnerable to extreme flooding. And we talk about Mozambique, Madagascar, Mexico, Venezuela, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia. A lot about water scarcity, particularly in North and East Africa, the Middle East and South Asia. Significant risk for global food security, particularly in India, in Africa, in the US even, and in Australia. And of course, loss of coral reef ecosystems with impacts on coastal economies and tourism. And a large scale biodiversity loss, dramatic reduction in ecosystem services. So the conclusion is that there's no certainty that adaptation to a four degree world is possible. But as Bob said, there are many studies that show there are still ways to keep temperatures below four degrees. Um, a little bit more detail of what's in the report. There is a summary of the last decade of extreme events and a discussion of the relative confidence of the linkage of climate change to extreme events. So the 2003 heat wave in Europe, the 2008 dry summer, and the 2011 US heat and drought are the ones in the darkest red where there's some high confidence there's a linkage. You see there's some very low and there's some mediums. And the numbers refer to the references which can be found under table one and that's on page 42 of the report. There's a discussion of um, how extreme events are changing the complex complexion of economics. So in 2011, this is the number of extreme events. It was 820. All the dots except the red ones are weather-related events. 
There used to be about 400 of these a year in the 60s. It rose to 600 in the 80s, and now there's routinely more than 800 of these extreme events. And the size of the circle in the region uh, tells you the number of events. So you can see that no one is immune. But if you look at how people could pay for those extreme events, this is the distribution of insurance. And now this is in who had insurance for the last 30 years of extreme events. You can see the poorest in the world who suffer the most have the least access to insurance. And although 3% of world GDP is spent on insurance, it's virtually a developed country thing. So disasters are much harder to recover from in the developed world. Again, there's discussions of what will happen to coral reefs, um, expected impacts as temperatures increase. All the corals are expected to be gone by about two degrees. Um, as an ecologist, I need to talk a little bit about exceptional ecosystems. We call them exceptional because we think they're irreplaceable or distinctive. And these are places where our conservation efforts are particularly focused and may not succeed. There are 185 of these exceptional ecosystems. Already 147 are threatened from other stresses like habitat, fragmentation, invasive species, air pollution, etc. And so on the brownest colors, you can see where the average temperature will be more than two standard deviations hotter than now for more than nine months. So even though the temperatures don't increase as much in the tropics as at the poles from climate change, the temperature changes that do occur will be very far from the normal temperature today. And you can see the Amazon and Sub-Saharan Africa look very bleak in these pictures. Um, oops, we're going backwards, aren't we? Uh, drought, this shows you the average drought expected at 3 degrees C, and the reds and purples are severe and extreme drought, respectively, becoming the, the average. And I would remind you again that the impact of drought on the poorest in the world is significantly different in terms of human pain and suffering than even the worst droughts in the United States or Europe. There's quite a bit in the report on sea level rise, and this just shows you regional sea level rise due to land ice melt only. Here, the thick green contour indicates the global average sea level rise of 1.4 millimeters a year. So anything inside that contour is above average rise, while everything outside that is below average sea level rise. And again, the impacts of sea level rise and storm surge are greater for the poor, as this picture of Bangladesh demonstrates, than for the rich. Um, heat waves, this map shows you the temperatures at the end of the century. So at the top, you're seeing absolute temperatures, and on the bottom, you're seeing the delta from current. So the darkest reds on the top are about 40 degrees C, approaching, again, I would say, physiological limits in some country, and the darkest red, the deltas on the bottom, are about 10 degrees C. There are going to be system interactions, and Chapter 7 of the PIC report to the World Bank focuses on interactions and potential nonlinearities, an area that I think we would all agree needs much more study. The risk is, of course, that there could be a proverbial straw, uh, that climate change could be the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back, superimposed on to top of other environmental stressors. Oops. That was it. I think it was breaking the camels back there. Let's see. No. <laughs> so much for my animation. <laughs> well, the domino effect. <laughs> but the point of um, multiple stresses and climate change overlaying them and, and uh, leading to nonlinearities or thresholds, I think, has been particularly shown when we think about uh, how a drought, not particularly of record, in the Rocky Mountain region of uh, the U.S., with only a one degree temperature increase, led to a massive outbreak of pests and to millions of acres of dead tree. And I think these kind of devils in the details of interactions of multiple stresses and climate change need a lot more work. Um, we've also seen very clearly in the last few years of our droughts and floods and heat waves how globally linked we all are and how crop failures in one place can cascade and interact with food or droughts to amplify impacts. <laughs> 
Uh, synchronicity is another concern. The Russian heat wave and the Pakistan flood in 2010 serve as an example. So during those events, the northern hemisphere jet stream exhibited a strongly meandering pattern which remained blocked for several weeks. And some recent analyses of planetary scale waves indicate that with increased global warming, extreme events could occur in a globally synchronized way more often. And then tipping points, a term that we all agree has been overused, there are threats of big tipping points such as these that would lead to irreversible changes. So what about the future? Well, clearly we have to avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable. And adaptation, the word adaptation is no longer a dirty word. And to me, adaptation embodies preparedness and resilience and robustness to climate change. Um, Adaptation needs are many, and these are some of them. I think this is a, a very important research agenda. Um, past is not prologue. We need to think about response strategies that can deal with composite stresses, infrastructure to deal with new extremes, not the last hundred years, varieties that perform well under a variety of condition. We might have to pick lands to preserve. We need to protect people better. We need to develop social safety nets. Insurance for developing countries becomes increasingly important. And I would argue we are adapting now and we better learn by doing and share best practices. So to me, this is a huge research agenda that has been barely scratched. And I think the science community has to take it up quickly. But I would argue also that practitioners are moving and they are trying to adapt to a changing climate and really that we have the catch-up work to do. So in the area of adaptation, the most work is going into what I would call characterizing risks and vulnerabilities. Um, an example of a practitioner tool that tries to look at this is, uh, this is the World Bank portal, and you can click on a continent and then a country. You can get data on the past. You can get impacts at different scales, such as agriculture and runoff. Um, and here is uh, the dashboard to look at Mozambique. And here's a composite of impacts and adaptive needs for Nepal. And so now for 31 countries, there's a comp compilation of information on vulnerability and adaptation needs and preliminary risk assessment analysis. Another area of nascent, but really, uh, hmm, I think very far did it. Uh, another area of really important um, need, but really only nascent work, is on valuing natural capital and the goods and services that they provide to humans. And this is the uh, Los uh, Plateau in China, which is an area as big as the size of France. And it was actually rehabilitated. And now in this current form, there's a reduced frequency of floods and landslides and better environmental conditions, both locally and thousands of miles away. And if you look, there are burgeoning websites of ecosystem efforts and ecosystem valuation, which you can find in the practitioner literature, but they're not often found in the academic or scientific literature. Also, a lot of practitioner effort is going into bolstering resilience and better protect physical capital, but unfortunately it's usually after a disaster, whereas proactive adaptation or green building from the beginning would be much preferred. But here's the, a UNEP website on adaptation learning mechanisms that is trying to share practices. Uh, innovation will clearly be essential because the past is no longer prologue and planning for the climate of the last century won't be sustainable. Some industries are taking this to heart. Recent extreme events have made companies aware that water, which is perhaps the linchpin of climate change, is becoming erratic and it's essential to their supply chain. And so it's spurring innovation for economic reasons, but it also has adaptive capacity. So the last thing I want to say is um, that I chaired at the first national summit on adaptation in 2010 at the request of the White House, the Council on Environmental Quality and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And we actually learned a lot about adaptation. We learned that one size doesn't fit all, but what was interesting as we tried to figure out what information different groups actually wanted at different levels, different regions and different sectors, they really need very similar kinds of information. Demographic, technological, climate data, trade, economic trends, policy regimes, institutions. Um, having access to data is not the same as having usable data, even if WMO and NOAA and NASA would load all of their precip data and model output on the web and expect communities to use it, it isn't that useful. So there needs to be some kind of portal um, to the science community and to communities in a translational role. We need to understand the cost of adaptation and the cost of not. 
There was lots of discussion about a clearinghouse for best practices of things that are being undertaken today at the local, the national, and the international level. We need to develop indicators of success. How do you know you've improved resiliency or adaptive capacity? And we heard a lot about wanting social and biophysical data layers. So if you could triangulate on where there are vulnerability or adaptation hotspots, for example, where the urban heat island effect intersects with the urban poor or water quality or soil erosion, you might be able to identify particular areas where early adaptation would be important. So I'm getting the hook, and the four-degree world is an unsustainable world. It's obviously a rich mitigation and adaptation agenda. And um, I wanted to leave you just with the thoughts of the next generation to whom we are leaving this planet. Um, it is our collective responsibility to find unselfish solutions and fast before it's too late to reverse the damage caused every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosina. Our next speaker, speaker is uh, Bob Kopp, Balancing Benefits and Costs in a 4C World. All right. Well, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a little bit intimidating becoming on the heels of Sir Robert Watson and Dr. Rosina Bierbaum. Um, but I think what I want to talk about sort of fits in a, 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 a trend in the direction of the talk. So, so Bob provided a, a very good picture of the risks inherent in an in, uh, increasingly warm world, uh, warm, a world where we're already starting to feel the dangerous effects of anthropogenic climate change in which we will continue to feel more of those. Um, Rosina talked about the risks for, uh, uh, for developing countries and also started to talk about some of the needs um, in terms of research agenda at the natural social science interface. Um, and I want to focus in on that interface. Um, and wait, hold on, let's get my slides up. So I want to focus in on this interface and look in particular um, from the perspective of benefit cost analysis because as we face the increasing challenges of the warming world, we're going to have to make a lot of small decisions that involve trade-offs between the risks of different policies, whether they're mitigation policies, potentially geoengineering products, or and adaptation policies and projects. Um, can we get them back on full screen? Can, can you guys take care of that? Um, we're going to face an increasing number of these trade-offs, and we need some way of, of, um, of uh, balancing them in a sensible manner. Um, the United, U.S. experience with sort of benefit-cost analysis of regulations, um, something I was involved in uh, during the couple years I spent at the Department of Energy, um, and sort of the key document uh, that came out of this pro uh, process was this report. Um, it's a very uh, highly public uh, or highly, highly uh, advertised Appendix 15A to a whole bunch of different regulatory rules um, trying to balance the, social, the marginal costs of climate change, the additional damage done by emitting extra tons of carbon dioxide so that those estimates could figure into the benefit cost analysis of regulation, things like energy efficiency rules, things like air quality standards. Um, so this report came out in March 2010. Um, it was a, a somewhat self-effacing report because this is a very hard task and there's a lot of challenges that I'm going to focus on in this talk that need to be addressed to be able to do this well. But it's been used in more than a dozen different uh, regulations that have been put into effect um, into the, in the last uh, couple years. If you add up the uh, benefits uh, estimated using these uh, numbers of the regulations, you're talking about benefits in the tens of billions of dollars. Um, and so one point I want to make is when we try to think about how to quantify the benefits of reducing climate change, um, you know, the, the, you're talking about benefits that are tens of billions of dollars, and yet the research groups working on that, you can literally count the individuals on, on two hands. And the amount of money being spent on trying to um, develop this decision-making tool compared to the, um, the, the value of the decisions being made is orders of magnitude difference. So one of the key tools in this process is something called integrated assessment modeling. Um, and what this is basically doing is a, you have a flow that enables you to couple together sort of the physical models and models of human systems. So 
um, just to some illustrative uh, sort of framework here. So you start out, go to economists, you get them to say, what is your projections for economic growth over the next, you actually have to do this out for century scale. Um, from that, using energy system models, we know how to, we can take this and come up with projections for different emission scenarios. Um, from this, you then can take those emission scenarios, go to a carbon cycle model, turn that into greenhouse gas concentrations, feed those greenhouse gas concentrations into a climate model, and get the physical climate impacts. Now, each of those steps involves models uh, coming from a particular discipline. But the next step, and the one that I want to focus on, is one that's particularly hard because you, natural scientists can't do it alone, economists can't do it alone. Um, it really requires very intimate dialogue between natural scientists, economists, and other social scientists. And that's how you take those climate change impacts and feed them back onto the economy. So that last step here, um, we don't have a, no, we do have a pointer. Um, this last step here of how we go from climate, physical climate represented here by temperature back into GDP, and then, of course, this all feeds back on itself. So there's five challenges I want to address. So one is a question of scale and aggregation. So there are an increasing number of detailed studies um, looking out over the next several decades, maybe next century, of the um, impact, local and regional impacts of climate change and what some of the potential effects of those on uh, economic and other human systems are. Uh, these are just a couple of title slides from a couple of assessments, sort of looking in detail at climate change impacts, say, in New York State, or in California. And if you're looking at adaptation, that's the level of resolution you want. You want local or regional scale, because that's where the adaptation projects have to be uh, done. Um, but if you're looking at sort of a broader scale questions, if you're looking at mitigation, the benefits are global. If you're looking at geoengineering projects, uh, the risks and the potential benefits are global. And even if you're looking at adaptation policies that set how you do adaptation projects, those benefits are also spread out over a broader level than these sort of detailed adaptation studies. So somehow you need to have to go from these to sort of more regional, national, global assessments that integrate this information. Um, and that's a very challenging task. And especially it's a challenging task because, as I said, the number of research groups and number of individuals working on this, you really can't count on uh, your two hands. So how do we get from those sorts of reports to estimates of global damages. Um, here I'm showing you on the y-axis, uh, damages as percent of global GDP has estimated by three different models out of the perhaps half dozen different models out there. These are the three that break those damages down by sector so you can sort of look at what's in them. Um, so DICE uh, is uh, Bill Nordhaus's model from Yale. Envisage is uh, from Rosen and Mensbrugge uh, that was originally developed at the World Bank and fund uh, from Richard Toll. Um, and just looking at those, uh, you can see that, well, maybe they agree sort of order of magnitude for their total. Um, they probably omit uh, some, some key areas. Um, but when you look at the details, you can see they're basically in completely lacking in agreement, right? Which is indication of the challenge of doing this. So for instance, if you look at agricultural impacts in a four degrees world, one of the models predicts there's net benefits, while others predict very small uh, costs. Um, if you look at fund, that's the model in green, that predicts the biggest cost associated with climate change is increased air conditioning demand. Um, if you look at Envisage, that's the World Bank model, um, that predicts the biggest cost associated with the climate change is the fact that, that humans are less productive and hotter in more human conditions. Um, so that's that red bar. And if you look at DICE, the biggest uh, potential impacts in that view are something that's not included in these other models, which is for the potential um, sort of expected damages associated with potential catastrophes. Um, so fairly significant lack of agreement here. Um, that's really because this area, these are research, these were developed as research tools, yet they're now being used to inform decisions that have sort of costs and benefits in the tens of billions of dollars. Um, so what can we do that, what can the, the sort of interface between the physical science community and the social scientists do to make this 
better, well, one thing people, we can start doing is trying to develop better empirical estimates of climate change impacts. Because we felt some of these effects of climate change, we can look at the historical record. This is something that in the physical climate modeling community people have been doing for a couple of decades trying to use um, physical, uh, historical observations to evaluate physical climate models. Here's an example um, from Schlinker and Roberts looking at the effects of um, temperature on corn yield, and you can see the sort of almost constant, uh, maybe slight increase with a sharp drop off that's fairly characteristic of effects of warming on crop yield. Um, and you can take something like this and feed it into um, things like where crops are and potential projections, uh, projections of temperature changes and ask the question, well, how does uh, empir empirically based estimate like this compare to some of the estimates in these models? Um, this is something that my collaborator Saul Seng showed in his talk on Monday. Uh, so here we're looking at percentage change in corn yield, or, or in agricultural yield in the US um, versus change in global mean temperature. This gray curve is based on imp those empirical relationships um, you saw uh, in that previous slide. Uh, the ri these are the three integrated assessment models we were looking at earlier. Um, and you can see, uh, as I said, some of them are predicting sort of net benefits up to two or three degrees warming. The empirical estimates are all showing significant uh, negative yield impacts, right? So can the lessons learned from evaluating physical climate models against historical observations be applied? Um, I think that's an important area for trying to do this in some rigorous fashion. Um, second, uh, all these models operate sort of by extrapolating impacts at relatively low temperatures to high temperatures. Obviously, it would be better if you could interpolate rather than extrapolate. Um, it would also be better to ha have estimates of impacts at high temperatures because we may not be in a four degree world. Maybe we'll be in an eight degree world in the next, early in the next century. Um, there's almost no literature on impacts at, that temp at these temperature levels. This is just one of the very few examples in the literature attempting to do some sort of impact assessment um, in a high temperature world. So this is work by Sherwood and Huber that they did a couple of years ago. Um, so they took the community atmospheric model um, and looked at different levels of, of warming. They looked at seven degree warming and 11 degree warming. And what they started to see emerging at a seven degree warming was a phenomenon that doesn't occur anywhere in the world today, which is that there are, point, there are places where there are periods of the year where it is too hot and humid for humans to physiologically survive. That is, in these places, if you didn't have air conditions, you would die because you couldn't cool yourself. So this is um, a plot for 11 degrees of warming. Um, so all the areas in this shade um, this is where what's something called the wet bulb temperature is above 35 degrees for the uh, peak area of the, of the year. Um, and what you can see by 11 degrees, all these pink areas um, expand to include the areas where more than half the human population currently lives. Now, 11 degrees warming is a lot of warming, um, but again, if we're trying to understand potential damages, we need to be looking at the high end and not just looking at the next two degrees and then trying to extrapolate beyond that. Um, and this may be especially important because four degrees may not be a stopping point, right? We could be in a four degrees world that looks like this green curve here with temperatures sort of peaking at four degrees. We could also be one where that's just a waypoint on track to much higher temperatures. Um, so a couple other points, I think this one is one that, that was mentioned in both the previous talk, is that a lot of these damages are not manifested through changes in averages, or changes in averages spread evenly. They're manifested through changes in averages, yes, but changes in averages delivered through unevenly distributed stochastic shocks, which is to say weather. Um, and coming from New Jersey, this is something that was driven home to me recently. Um, this is uh, Mantelock in New Jersey. If this is a picture from USGS in May 2009. Um, this is a picture of the same area a month ago. And when you think about damages like these, right? Let's say the, 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 the damage estimate from, from uh, Sandy in New Jersey was about $70 billion, which is about $2,000 for every man, woman, and child in the New York metro area. Um, we live in a country with a well function, basically well functioning government and basically well functioning insurance market. So that risk is going to be spread very broadly. Um, and so for the people affected, it's terrible, but it's not terrible in the way it would be if they were somewhere without those safety networks, right? If you're, let's think about agricultural impacts. Let's say that 
decrease in yield was delivered has no change nine out of 10 years and a complete crop failure one out of 10 years. If you're in the US, you have crop insurance, you, know, you can sort of treat that the way you might treat a 10% loss in yield. If you're living somewhere without that safety network, that welfare loss associated with that one year where you have a concrete crop failure is immense. Um, and th these sorts of stochastic, the weather is not in, really in any of these attempts to look at sort of the integrated costs up to a global level. Uh, and finally, uh, this is something we all know. I think um, when we use complex models to make projections, you always want your complex models to do the best job possible. So they're always going to be tuned to capture the modes of distributions rather than the tails. Uh, but if we're thinking about risk, we need to capture the tails as well. Um, this is just an example from Jared Rowe. So the blue curves, here we're looking at climate sensitivity. The blue curves are the IPCC class. Uh, models and the climate sensitivity estimated from these. These are other ways of estimating the distribution of climate sensitivity, and none of these capture the, the risk, the, the potential tail, um, because you're not going to invest huge numbers of, of, of computing hours in, um, in trying to capture the tail. You want to do the best job you can. Um, likewise, if we think about tipping points, uh, Rosina already showed this slide, um, we need to think about what the probability of different potential um, climate surprises, potential tipping points are, and we also need to think about what their socioeconomic impact is. Aside from the socioeconomic impact of um, sea level rise, there's basically no literature on what, say, disruption of the Indian summer monsoon, die off of the Amazon rainforest, any of these other potential tipping points uh, might be. Um, so these aren't figured into any of these estimates. Uh, so to summarize, uh, the sort of five areas I highlighted that I think are necessary if we want to have real decision tools based on balancing the costs of climate change against the cost of, and of action. Um, so one, we need a way of a pipeline for aggregating up these regional studies to a much broader scale. Uh, we need to think about model evaluation. Uh, we need to think about bracketing damages from above, looking beyond four degrees C. Um, we really need to think about the effect that a lot of these damages are delivered through weather and through, through extreme events. Um, and we need to have uh, some more serious thinking about climate surprises and what their potential human impact are. Thank you. Thank you very much. We unfortunately don't have time for questions. And we do have one final presentation. Um, let's just put the there. Um, it was written by Dr. Dan Cahan at Yale. Dan can't be with us today, and Jay Gulledge, uh, my co-convener for this session, has graciously offered to present a pricey of his uh, presentation. Yeah, and, and this is with Dan's blessing, and I am a, a wo woefully inadequate replacement. I'm not in his field. I have been talking to him for about three years about these things, and so uh, I think some of the points are important enough that I'm going to give this a try. This is about half of his slides. Um, I've made a couple of tweaks to help me, so I've, you'll see some things that say, you know, added by Gulledge and things like that, just, just so that I can uh, get through this. But uh, pray for me, please. Uh, <laughs> but I, I put this picture of Dan. That's not his slide. I, I, but just, just uh, you know, I, I thought about getting a wig, but I couldn't find an appropriate one. So, um, But his email is there. Um, and he's got a website where you can find all of the papers that I'm going to describe inadequately here. Um, so the title of his talk is, What Does the Science of Science Communication Have to Say About the Climate Change Conflict? And by the climate change conflict, he means that climate change has become politically polarized and we can't get action on it as a result. Um, and within that, there's, there's, there's a communication challenge for science, and he calls this the science communication problem. And basically what he, what he means by that is the science community thinks one thing, but there's this division in, pu in the public, opinion-wise, that does not exist in the scientific community. So where, where, what's lost in translation there? And that's the problem that he's talking about. So here he, he presents... Uh, uh, what he deems a plausible but incorrect explanation that, that uh, I'll show s some of his results on. Um, then he posits an alternative explanation that he says is a better one, and then he wants to offer a solution. So I'm going to try to go through that really, really quickly. The plausible but incorrect explanation, Dan says, is this idea that the public is irrational, uninformed, can't handle the science, etc., not enough information, all of those kinds of things. 
Um, <clears throat> that's a hypothesis. So Dan and his team went out and tested that hypothesis. And so very briefly, there are ways, the NSF in fact has tests to test people on their, are they scientifically literate and are they numerate? So they can, can they think in numbers and do they understand science? They screened survey, uh, survey participants for literacy and numeracy. They also screened them, and this will come in in a moment, for political ideologies. Um, and the Pitt hypothesis, the public irrationality thesis, would predict that people with low literate science literacy and low numeracy um, would depart from the scientific community on their impression of how risky climate change is, whereas those with higher literacy and more numeracy, uh, greater numeracy, would uh, come closer to the way scientists think about it. Um, and in fact, what they found <clears throat> was that in both cases, those with low science literacy and numeracy were slightly more concerned about climate change than those with high literacy and numeracy. Now, those are not big differences. They, they don't seem to explain the, the distance in the gap, the polarization gap, but they go in the opposite direction of what the Pitt hypothesis uh, would, would predict. So um, what uh, he, he says, therefore, that <clears throat> the, the, the public irrationality thesis is not holding up in that case. So what is a better alternative hypothesis would be that people employ motivated reasoning. I went on the web to find some psychologist statement of what that means. And and so uh, a social psychologist at Buffalo University said, uh, motivated reasoning is when people actually seek out information that confirms what they already believe, regardless of whether they are scientifically literate. And so uh, this is where Kahan and his team did go and, and, and parse people according to their worldviews or ideologies. Are they hierarchical individuals or are they egalitarian in their worldview? and are they individualistic versus communitarian. And uh, in general, hierarchical individualists tend to be political conservatives, and egalitarian communitarians tend to be political liberals or progressives. And we already know, they didn't test for this, we already know well that hierarchical individuals perceive low risk from climate change and, and the use of nuclear power. They also, uh, whereas uh, egalitarian communitarians perceive high risk from those two things. Hierarchical individualists perceive low risk from guns, but high risk from gun control, and the opposite for uh, egalitarian communitarians. So this is already known, and they want to use this understanding to see how this ideology overlays on their take on, on the risk of climate change. So going back to this same um, kind of uh, chart, we see that the hierarchical individualists perceives very low risk of climate change, and the egalitarian communitarian uh, perceives very high risk. That's not a surprise, we already knew that, but they wanted to know how does this overlay on scientific literacy and numeracy. And uh, so if you take those two groups and parse them accordingly, what you find is that, in fact, the higher, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, um, egalitarian communitarian, that's really hard to say a lot of times, High literacy and numeracy actually uh, makes them more concerned than their um, illiterate counterparts, if you will. Um, whereas for the um, hierarchical individualist, higher numeracy and literacy makes them less concerned than their ideological counterparts. So the point here really is that, um, or the, the novel observation is that while the polarization is largely explained by differences in ideology, high scientific literacy actually increases the polarization. And the way Dan explains this is that these people are actually better analytically at justifying their, pre, their pre-existing beliefs than their counterparts who are less literate. So, um, so, uh, What's the solution? So Dan talks about a contaminated science communication environment, um, and he basically saying we need a new field of science, of the science of science communication. Uh, we need to use lab models just as natural scientists do, um, but which is done a lot, but we also need to run field experiments to, ver to validate those models, which is done less. 
Um, so this is just, I, I can't talk about this slide much except to say that it's pointing out various, various lab models, if you will, for, for you know, psychological theories for how people might perceive risk. Um, and uh, Dan talks about if you use these models, you apply them, but as untested assumptions based on an ad hoc mix, of mat, mix and match of general psychological mechanisms without evidence on how they play out in a given context, this leads to what he calls science storytelling instead of science communication. And um, here's a field test that Dan and his, and his uh, colleagues ran, um, and it was how do people perceive the risk of climate change if you do or do not give them information about geoengineering? So common stories that we tell about communication, about geoengineering, are that it's scary, it'll polarize the public, it, it will reduce the urgency for CO2 emissions uh, reductions, so the moral hazard. Uh, but are these true? These are really hypotheses. And when they ran the tests, they found that giving um, uh, a, a story, information about climate change in an anti-pollution context, pollution's bad, we should clean it up, polarization was greater between the two ideological communities than if you also included information about geoengineering, which gave um, the more conservative ideologues in the, in the survey population something that they kind of like, technology as a solution, you know, so some, some kind of, of way out. So the point is that it reduced polarization to some degree. So... Um, Contrary, they also found that contrary to the hypothesis that geoengineering would provoke discounting of climate ch change risks in general, providing geo information, geoengineering information all actually made the conservatives in the audience slightly more concerned about climate change. Uh, so the point really is not that geoengineering's good or we should talk about it or, you know, that's, that wasn't the question. The question was, are we right about the stories that we tell about how people will perceive geoengineering and what its effects will be? Okay, so this I'm wrapping up here, and um, he the last point here is that you know you need real research, you need research at every stage of form, formulating communication, executing it, and then evaluating its effects, um, and you have to conserve the information from the experiences of science communication, and those last, uh, th those points he is saying are, are not really heated in the, uh, the way we communicate science on risky, controversial issues today. So that's the best I can do with this. Um, and some implications for communicating about high warming, this is just my takeaway. Um, if we can, this implies to me that if we continue with this sort of the public lacks sufficient sophistication to deal with this or we need to put more information out there, that's the solution. In the context of a more threatening world where the science is suggesting more dire consequences, it could actually drive ide people into their ideological corners more firmly than they, than they already are. So more of the same but more danger. Uh, could, could, could be even more polarizing. Um, and we need to embed cognitive research into the formulation and, and uh, execution of science communication. And I've done a lot of science communication, and I've really never done that. Uh, and I know a lot of other people do science communication, and I don't see them doing that. So that's really what Dan means with the science of science communication. Thanks. Thank you, Jay, for that um, brave presentation. I do want to remind folks that if you want more information on Dan Cahan's work, culturalcognition.net is a wonderful website that he and his colleagues have developed. Uh, so it's time to close this session. Uh, we don't even have time for closing remarks, so I won't make them, but I do want to thank you all for coming. Uh, and um, we've got a lot of work to do to uh, uh, prepare for a 4C world and to inform the public on how to do that. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>